what was it like when the war started, you know? Okay, I was a young 18-year-old kid, and uh, in November, when I turned 18, uh, I was wandering. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I got out of school, high school. I took a job in a hardware store and uh, for $18 a week. And uh, I said, nah, there's got to be something better than this. So one day I went down to a local, another town nearby, and it was a Marine recruiting officer there, and there were two Marines in their dress blues, and I said, man, that's for me. <laughs> I didn't have signed up. Well, that was November, and uh, they said, okay, uh, we'll give you a notice, and you'll come in for induction in a few weeks down in New York. Uh, a couple of weeks went by, and the war broke out, and uh, everything was chaotic. Uh, I got a notice and they said, uh, we're going to defer your induction for a while for two reasons. Number one, the big influx of recruits signing up. Plus, I was supposed to go to Paris Island for boot camp and they had an outbreak of measles down there. So they said, we're not going to take any more recruits. Stand by until we call you. Well, that went into December. And uh, the attitude of the country, because it was... You know, we've been bombed, and, and, and the rumors that were flying around the town, did you hear the Japs were landing in San Diego, and the Germans were in Miami, and the rumors were wild. People were just, you know, panicking. Uh, things settled down, and uh, it went on in, in a normal, cautious manner. And uh, then the first thing you know, I got a call and they said, okay, you report to 90 Church Street, New York, for induction. And it, this was late in December, and I went down. It was a snowy day. Uh, two friends of mine, buddies, went with me, and uh, I was sworn in. It was late in the afternoon, and uh, we got on the train, and <coughs> train started to take off. And of course, I, I soon going to Paris Island. Uh, and we're riding, and I know New York pretty well in the state. And I said, this train is not heading south, it's heading north. And we had, I think there was about four cars on the train, Pullman cars. And these, this is a steam train, now, there was no diesel in these days, this was a steam train. So uh, there was a gunnery sergeant aboard the train. He came by and I said, Sergeant, I said, uh, we're supposed to be heading south. And my compass says, we're heading north. He said, you're right. I said, where are we going? He said, you're going to Buffalo. I said, Buffalo? Paris Island's that way. No, you're going to Buffalo. Well, okay. The Marine Corps knows what they're doing. We went to Buffalo. <laughs> we went to Buffalo. We went to Chicago. We came down through Illinois, Indiana, and all at major cities, we stopped, we hooked on another car full of recruits. We had one engine, we started with two engines and about 14 cars full of recruits. Went all the way down south to Texas, across Texas, over to San Diego. That's where I went through boot camp in San Diego. That was about a 10-day train ride. Now, you have to appreciate this. This is a steam train. There's no air conditioning. And... The head, if you've ever been on these old things, is about as big as a little broom closet, a sink about this big, sort of like a head on a plane today, you know. And, and <laughs> there's no water, you can't wash. You've got to open the window if you want air, well, all the black smoke comes in. <laughs> we were the dirtiest, the scroungiest bunch of recruits that ever came in. How long? Uh, it was about eight to ten days it took us to go all the way down. Now, we stopped at little towns along the way to pick up more recruits and stuff like that. We weren't allowed off the train, but there were some lo local USO ladies, and they came with donuts and coffee. I think all we had to eat on that train was American cheese sandwiches, if I recall. It was a car where you could get something to eat. And uh, we got to San Diego, and they pulled us into a freight yard. And I, I'm sure they didn't want anybody to see this mess. <laughs> they pulled us into a freight yard, had six-by-six six trucks all covered up. Get out of the train, into the truck, 
cover you up and bring you into the base. <laughs> and and uh, that's where boot camp started. And uh, it was a heck of a train ride. And I remember talking to some of the guys and they said, you know, this is dumb. Is this what the Marine Corps is going to give us? <laughs> and we entered into the barracks that, that evening and uh, we hadn't really had a good meal in about eight days. And uh, I said, go into the mess hall and uh, get something to eat. And I was introduced to hominy grits at that time. <laughs> and they brought out hominy grits and greasy pork chops. And they said, there's your supper. And we sat down and I didn't. I said, what are these things? They're like camper balls. And it was this guy from Arkansas with me. And he said, them's hominy grits. They're good. <laughs> and how do you eat those? They want salt and pepper and butter, you know? So anyhow, we ate. And uh, then we are taken over to uh, Quonset Huts. And uh, next morning, we were given clothes. And boot camp started. Uh, while I was in boot camp, uh, right after, I should say, right after we graduated, I was in a casual company waiting assignment. And uh, by this time, you know, you felt that you were a Marine. You had decent clothes and you went through training. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, the first Marine Raider Battalion was formed on the East Coast. And they brought over to San Diego. And they were quartered in some Quonset huts nearby. And uh, one day the sergeant come by and he said, <clears throat> we're looking for some volunteers. And uh, he said, First Marine Raider Battalion needs some replacements. <laughs> I raised my hand, I volunteer for anything. So he said, okay, take a physical. And this was Colonel Edson's First Marine Raider Battalion. Uh, we got, <clears throat> I was brought in, given a physical, and in the battalion, every man had a job, every man had a special weapon. And uh, we went through a lot of drill. Man, I mean, these guys, they run you day and night, exercise all the time. They took no one in the battalion who was sick, lame, or lazy. As soon as they found out you were out, they took a replacement. I replaced some Marine who ended up sick, I guess. And uh, <clears throat> I was with them for about three or four days. And uh, <clears throat> one day they said, OK. Uh, we're getting ready to ship out, and you got to go down to the docks and load your own ship. It was a transport down on a big dock down in San Diego, and uh, all our gear was in the warehouse, and uh, we had to carry ammunition and food and everything out through the big doors onto the thing, on, and put it in cargo nets, and hoist it up, bring it on the ship. And I was carrying a case of 45 ammunition. And it had rained a little bit, and I went through the door. There was a steel treadle there, and I slipped. And the case come down on my foot. And, oh, I jumped around, continued my job, and uh, got back on the truck, went back to the base. And we all hopped off the truck. Well, I hopped off the truck and hit that foot, and I went down in the heap. Oh, the gunny walks over, and he says, what the hell was that all about, Dreve? Oh, I said, I just tripped Gunny. He said, yeah. He said, give me about 15 double times in place. <laughs> Man, I couldn't, I couldn't lift my feet. So he said, sick bay. Well, he had, he said, had a small fracture. He said, you're out. My term in the 1st Marine Raider Battalion was finished. <laughs> and that was, uh, after that, I was assigned <clears throat> other guard duty. Uh, my next assignment was Imperial Beach, which was a naval radio station down near the Mexican border. And uh, that was good duty on that beach down there. We had 16 Marines and 32 sailors. They manned a radio station. And uh, we were the guard group. It was right on the beach. Uh, I spent a couple, three months there. And then uh, I got leave. So they said, well, you, you haven't been home yet. And he said, you're close to me over a year. And he said, uh, a lieutenant was a Navy lieutenant in charge. He said, we'll give you leave. I said, fine, thank you. And I made arrangements to go back home. 
Well, I got back home, and the war was going on, and things were being rationed. Well, <laughs> when I got home, my mother says, boy, am I glad to see you. And I said, yeah, I'm glad to see you too, Ma. She said, come on, we're going down to the war rationing office. Every town had a ration. Everything was rationed. I said, what for? And she said, we can get more food. If you had a military member come home on leave, everybody was so much meat, so much butter, and so forth. And, but if you had a military member come at home on leave, you could get more. But you have to drag them down there in person <laughs> to show them to the guy. Okay, and you get extra food stamps with meat. She said, boy, we're going to have meat. <laughs> and and uh, they were, they were, uh, everybody was glad to see you, you know. And, but that, for all my time in the car, I got two leaves. One, that one and an emergency leave one time. My sister-in-law died. And... Uh, after that, I was Imperial, Imperial Beach. Then I was taken to Point Loma Naval Ammunition Depot. And a little story. Can I tell a story? Sure. <laughs> okay. I don't want to bore you guys. You know. But we were guard duty for this ammunition depot. And uh, the, the igloos were up on the hillside. And they had all kinds of ordnance in there. Uh, and one day I pulled up a truck. And they said, OK, we've got to take six torpedo warheads down to the Navy base, put on a submarine. So they loaded six torpedo warheads about this big onto the stake truck. See, well, the sailor's driving it. And I'm just the guard. And he ties them all on there with a rope. But it was a Sunday morning, <clears throat> Sunday morning. And we, it, and we take off out of the base. And we're heading down to the shipyard. And he's a hot dog. He's, oh, he's going, man, this thing, this thing bounce along the streets. And he makes a sharp right-hand turn. The line snaps. Six warheads, and this is just a stake truck, you know, just stakes on this. Six warheads, boom, off and rolling down the street to San Diego. <laughs> torpedo warheads. And I'm guard duty. I'm running around trying to keep these things from rolling all over the place, you know. But they didn't, they didn't go off, so San Diego was still in one piece. <laughs> uh, they brought in a bomb truck, reloaded, and I don't know what happened to the cell. It was a funny experience, though, chasing six <laughs> torpedo warheads down the street. Yeah. Um, after that, I would point Loma, I was sent to El Toro, and I had the uh, best tour of my duty in the Marine Corps was when I was at El Toro. Uh, I was on a security a crash crew up there, and um, I met a lot of nice movie stars, and I had a couple of nice experiences. Again, <clears throat> one day, the uh, captain came out and he said, uh, I'm looking for two volunteers to go to a movie. I raised my hand, said, I'll go to a movie anytime. <laughs> okay, what are we going to do? He didn't tell us. He said, get your best uniform, all shined up. A certain date, he said, we're going to take you to a movie. He said, fine. We did that, a buddy of mine, and they loaded us up in a nice car, and we took us up to Hollywood. <laughs> we finally got there, and I said, what are we going to do? And he said, you are going to the premiere of Guadalcanal Diary in Grauman's Chinese Theater, and you will escort a movie star. I said, I will? <laughs> yes. Jean Crane. And she was, I was her escort. And then with all the fanfare on the red carpet, because you know Guadalcanal Diary was the first movie that they made about the war. And it yeah. gave the spirits up and boosted the spirit of the country. And uh, I sat in that movie with Gene Crane and watched Guadalcanal Diary. That was a nice experience that I had there. Good movie. Uh, yeah, it was a good movie, yeah. I met a couple of the stars that were in the movie, too, you know, and that, while we were there. I had a good friend who was stationed with me at El Toro, and he had a sister who lived in Hollywood who was married to a man who had a dry cleaning business who cleaned a lot of the actresses and actors' clothes. So he knew a lot of these people. Well, on a weekend, we'd get liberty, he and I, and we'd go up to see his sister. And uh, they didn't have any kids, and they were always glad to see us. So we went up one weekend, and uh, they said that they had an invitation to go to a wedding. 
but they refused because she told the guy who asked them, she said, uh, I'm entertaining my brother and his friend, two Marines from El Toro. I said, no, bring them along. Where is this wedding? It's in Beverly Hills. Uh, the invitation was from Alan Mowbray, if you ever remember Alan Mowbray. He was, played a butler, English butler a lot in the movies. And his sister was getting married uh, up in Berry Hills, and we were invited to the wedding. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we went to the church, and we'd, we'd driven up to the church, and we walked in and walked up the front and sat down very cautiously. And the next thing you know, a man slid in alongside of me, and I kept my eyes up front, you know, and then I glanced over, and it was um, Charles Boyer oh, sat next to me. <laughs> And he smiled, and we smiled at him, and so oh, forth. After the wedding, we were taken to this Alan Mowbray's home, Beverly Hills, a beautiful place. Big party. And uh, there were a lot of people there. The one I remember in particular was Ethel Smith. Have you ever heard of Ethel Smith? She was a famous organist. She could play the organ. She was great. And she played music all night. Wine, women, and song. We stayed overnight with a heck of a hangover. The next day we were taken back, but it was a nice experience. Oh, yes. and, and after El Toro, uh, I was transferred back to Pendleton. I went through uh, infantry instructor school and was pulled out to be an instructor, which I was for a while. And I kept telling my captain, I'd like to go overseas, you know. I think I've had a good Hollywood Marine job here, but I think my duty is overseas with some uh, an active outfit. He said, you don't want to do that, Dreve. He was a Guadalcanal vet, as a matter of fact. And uh, I said, I plead with him. He said, okay, I'll ship you out on the next thing. And he released me, and I was shipped out. And that's when I joined the 1st Division before the Pelotu operation. At that beautiful island of Paluvu. We were on White Beach. It was the second day in. We took a hell of a beating. And as I mentioned to Hawk, it was so hot. I remember I passed out probably for about 10 minutes after we hit the beach. It, you, it was, it, you know, you're being shot at from one thing or another, and then at 115 degrees, and you got two canteens of water. That's all you had, two canteens, and until they brought in this other putrid water. But anyhow, uh, on the second day, uh, our company was moving in slightly, and our regimental commander was Chesty Puller. Uh, he came up to our company, and my company commander was Captain Everett Pope, and he said, uh, Pope, he said, there's a hill, I can't remember the number, every hill had a number, 454 or something, a little knob up there, and he said, uh, get your company up on that knob. He said, intelligence tells us it's a high point. And, and you, when you're up there, you'll be able to look down on another valley with the Japs and everything else. He said, it'll be a, a good vantage point. Uh, okay, we started off, went through a swamp. There was a little road, and it had, we had a tank with us. And the tank was going along, but it was very narrow, and the tank went off into the swamp. He couldn't get out. <laughs> they brought in another tank to get him out. It got stuck. So we forget the tank. We went in. We lost a few men approaching this hill. We finally fought our way up the hill. We had 32 Marines going up. Uh, I think by the time we got to the top of the hill, we probably had about 28. Well, we got to the hill, and intelligence was crazy. I don't know where they got their information from, but we weren't on the top, we were in the middle. The Japs were above us and the Japs were below us. And it was all coral. I mean, and, and this coral is sharp, right? Well, it'd rip your clothes up and everything else. You couldn't dig in, you just piled rocks. Uh, well, we formed a little perimeter around a cliff and uh, it, it was starting to get dark at this point. And uh, we formed a little perimeter, our company in there, and uh, as, as soon as it started to get dark, the Japs, well, they were popping away at us from above. Uh, then they started a heavy mortar barrage from the low, lower part, and they started a bonsai charge 
up the hill. We could hear them coming. We couldn't really see them. But they hear yabbering away, and they'd come up the hill, and we'd fire back. Well, this went on for quite a, maybe a couple hours, and by this time, we're running out of ammunition. We have no very Everybody is low on ammo, and uh, we're losing men, getting hit. Uh, Captain Pope is running up and down the line. He says, pat you on the back. He said, all right, Marine, hang in there. We're going to get out of here. So we hunkered down, and... Um, another charge came up, and then we were out of ammunition, so we, well, let's do something. We pick up rocks, we throw it down the hill. Well, the Japs are coming up, and these rocks are rolling down. They think they're hand grenades, so they scurry back down, but then the rocks don't go off. So they, so they get a little smart, so they come back up and try it again. We throw more rocks, but on a third time, they're not going to stop. See, they're coming. By this time, they're close. Whatever grenades we had left, we let them have it. We ran out of ammunition. We threw uh, ammunition boxes at them, machine gun boxes. I mean, it finally got to hand to hand. They came over the list, and uh, you went hand to hand with them. We threw them off of cliffs, and, and uh, they, they, some of them got in. A lot of guys got killed. Make a long story short, come dawn, we came out. We had eight men left out of 32. It was Captain Pope, myself, and seven others. And we were the only ones left. And we called for relief earlier in the evening uh, while we still had a walkie-talkie, but that went out. But they said, hold your position, and uh, which we did during the night. We were relieved the next morning. And uh, uh, we came off of that hill with eight, eight Marines. And uh, <clears throat> Captain Pope, we got down to the bottom to a... Uh, another area where we could recoup and get clothes and food. And uh, we were sitting there, a bedraggled bunch, and Colonel Polk come up to Captain Pope and he said, Captain, he said, get your company together. He said, and go back up on that hill. And Captain Pope said, well, he said, I thought I was going to get caught, Marshal, but he says, I'll be goddamned if I will. He says, I went up with 32 men. I got eight men left. I don't have a company. He said, go around and get a company. Captain Pope said no. Colonel Pull turned around and he walked away, and that was the end of it. And they sent the thing. But uh, that was uh, the worst battle that I was ever in, uh, sitting on that hill that night, fighting Japs hand to hand all the way down. We went through Peleliu, Okinawa. Oh, the one last thing to find us up. After the war ended on Okinawa, we were sent to the northern part of the island. And of course, again, the rumors, the war is over. Man, the first division's going home. A big parade in San Francisco. No, it's going to be in New York. This and that, everybody. And it, we're wild. The jungle juice was flowing. I don't know where it all came from. But there was plenty of jungle juice. <laughs> And then one day they said, okay, fall out by company for sick bay. And, All right, you know, fall out for something. <clears throat> we fell out for sick bay, lined up, and he said, uh, you're going to get shots. Shots? Well, the well, Marine Corps always gives you a shot. I've got nothing to do with it, give you a shot, right? So <laughs> I said to the corpsman, I said, what's this shot for? He said, cholera. I said, cholera? There's no cholera in the United States. He said, I know that. He said, but who said you were going to the United States? I said, we assumed that. The war is over. He said, no, you're going to North China. North China. I said, whew, the other end of the earth, you know. But that's another story. Uh, I, we went to China, and I spent four, five, six months there. And I really enjoyed it because we had our problems with the Chinese communists. But I enjoyed China. It was one of those places that... As a young boy, it was mystique, you know, it was a foreign place, you only read about it. And we had the rare opportunity, uh, when we got there, they opened up the Forbidden City in Peking, which no Occidental had been in in over a couple of hundred years. Occidentals were not allowed in there, but they opened it up, and we went through all the palaces and uh, everything in, in Peking, and uh, I got to go up to the walk on the Great Wall of China 
When the Chinese communists found out the war was over, they came out of the woodwork like worms. Before the war, you never saw them. I mean, while the war was on, they never bothered anybody up there. They were hiding somewhere. Once the war was over and there was no resistance from the Japanese, the communists came out and they came to us. They came to the Marines and we had many, we lost a lot of Marines in North China, not being known. We had a lot of firefights with the communists, Chinese communists. They'd come in to move into the city uh, at night. I was in Tencent and we'd make a patrol, you know, through a truck around the streets. And all of a sudden you come down one block and the next thing you know, there's a whole bunch of Chinese communists with a barricade there. Oh, you know, we don't speak Chinese, they don't speak American, you know. And it's me, you business, me, you, you, so forth. But anyhow, uh, we sort of play it low key and we didn't want to get into a firefight with them, yet they had no business blocking the streets. <laughs> so one night we were there and uh, the communists came out, there were about mm, eight Chinese soldiers and they had a truck and they stopped us. We had four men in a truck or jeep and uh, they stopped us and there was a lot of palaver going on. And uh, the, the old cigarette always seems to get away. You break out a pack of cigarettes or offer them a cigarette, you know, that everybody smoked. Uh, so the, we were talking to the Chinese and we could always say, you could tell a Chinese general by how many fountain pens he had in his pocket. <laughs> if he had a dozen, he was a big guy. <laughs> He probably couldn't write, but he had a lot of fountain pens in his pocket. <laughs> and we cut, they had uh, bolt action rifles. And uh, we said, you know, say, can we steal your rifles? And, uh, oh, you know, was, things eased off a little bit. The guy would show us the rifle and we'd pass it. Take the bolt down. <laughs> in the back of his rifle, he didn't know where the bolt was gone. <laughs> and finally we got a half dozen bolt and he said, that's it. Get out of the way. <laughs> We went on our way, but there were incidents where they were attacking the cold trains, and and uh, we had a lot of a lot of firefights. I wasn't in a firefight with them, but the uh, other troops were in the division war. We were losing our shirt over there. It was only when the big naval battles were Coral Sea and Midway where the tide turned, uh, uh, but that was air and sea, and the land. Uh, uh, Acquisitions of island hopping was still minimum. You remember there were Taro and a few of them. There was a lot of fighting going down in the Philippines, but the Marines were taking all these little islands uh, on the way up. But the papers said you know, how great the Marines were doing, and uh, it was a big boost to the morale of the company, uh, to the country. Uh, I was looking through some of my papers yesterday, and my parents saved. All the newspapers where Marines were involved from the New York papers, and I was looking through, I have all these papers from the Journal American, the De Daily News with headlines of what the Marines were doing and how the country was responding. <coughs> uh, it, was, it was good, it was, it was encouraging, because we didn't get that much information. You know, We were only with our division. Well, what's the Marine Corps doing? Well, if we hear the Marines are taking tarot or, or something like that, you know, but uh, everything was centered around your division and what you were doing at that time. And plus, uh, we didn't have, in today's war, there's communications, you can talk to your family. We wrote letters, and the letters were all censored, right? You, you wrote a letter home, you had to go to your company lieutenant or commander, and he read your letter. If you said anything about the Japanese in there, psh, he'd cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh. Yeah. Everything was censored. Let's give them a big round of applause.